Okay then, folks. Um, let's get started. Hello, my name is Matt. Thank you for coming. Last session of the conference. Hope you've all had a good one. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, Rider and how you use it as the default script editor for Unity. Uh, how you get it all set up, how you get going, take a bit of a tour of the features, and how it's going to help you with um, hopefully writing uh, better Unity scripts and also have a better experience doing so. So um, first things first and everything, does everybody know what Rider is? Small show of hands. Anybody used it? Awesome. That's looking good. I like those. I like that. That's good. Um, for those of you who don't know, Rider is a cross-platform C-sharp editor with a deep understanding of Unity. Um, and it's important that we say this, uh, it's cross-platform in that it works on Mac, Windows, and Linux. It's the same experience across all those uh, different platforms. Uh, and it's, uh, although we call it an editor, we're more used to really calling it an IDE, an integrated um, development environment. And the I bit is really important because it's got everything there already set up for you so you don't have to waste time setting up things like debugging or setting up uh, version control. That's all just built in. It's got a deep understanding of Unity, and I'll show you some of those in a, in a few minutes. Uh, and the other thing I want to point out, really, is that it's based on ReSharper and IntelliJ. This is useful if you're already familiar with some of these tools. ReSharper is a plug-in to Visual Studio. It provides a whole bunch of useful features, um, from uh, navigation to code completion and so on. Uh, and it's something which we've been building for quite a while now, so it's, it's got a great foundation to build on. Uh, and it's also based on IntelliJ and reuses some of the things from the IntelliJ ecosystem. So again, if you're familiar with something like IntelliJ or WebStorm or AppCode or Android Studio, for example, you'll feel at home then with Rider. So what does it mean? What, 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 do, what do we get out of all of this? Um, there's a whole bunch of things, really. Um, the, the things we get that uh, an IDE can give us uh, with a deep understanding of our code, uh, a whole lot of really good navigation. We've got some really good smart code completion, which I'll show you in a second. Loads of refactorings. We can rewrite your code. We can fix your code up, find issues, and help you rewrite those. We've got inspections to try and find common coding mistakes uh, and fix those before you actually hit them, uh, and also to help you work with best practices and um, hopefully get better code out of the end of it. We can also help you generate code as well. There's a key thing we want to do with Rider, um, and that's we want to reduce the amount of time that you spend switching between Unity and the script editor. We want you to spend more time thinking about the game you're building, uh, the experience you're building, rather than actually worrying about your code, your code editor, and so on. And so one of the key things we want to do there is we want to find the problems before you hit them at runtime. So it's great that Unity is built on C Sharp and it's strongly typed, and you could get a compiler and you get to see when things are wrong. But there's a lot of things that Unity does at runtime uh, that a compiler wouldn't pick up. And we want to be able to bring those in so that you don't waste your time going to Unity, running something, hitting a problem at runtime, coming back, having to fix it, then getting back to where you were before and wasting all that time. And um, basically, I've just stuck this slide in because it's, uh, it's a good one. So um, it's not just us that say it's nice and everything. Uh, we've got lots of people who are already using it and think it's, uh, it's, it's fun and useful. OK, so um, starting with a new editor, script editor, can be a little daunting at times, especially when you look at the number of menus there are and how to uh, get started and everything. So I'm going to give you two survival tips, two keyboard shortcuts. And these two keyboard shortcuts will get you uh, into all of the entry points of all of the functionality in the editor that's available to you. The first one is a simple one, shift and shift. Just hit shift, shift, and then you start searching. This is our keyboard shortcut to just search everywhere. When we first open a project, uh, we index the whole of your project. We know what's there. We know what's uh, the, the structure of everything. And so you can very easily and very quickly search for something. And so you just hit shift, shift, and start typing. And we'll take you to that particular class. But you don't have to just type in the whole name of the class. You can use the initial letters of those classes as well. So if you're doing something like um, Tower Defense Input Scheme Switcher right on time, uh, then you can just do TDISS, and it'll very quickly get there. And that's a very quick way to navigate around your code base, because those set of initials are surprisingly uh, infrequently used throughout your project. And it's not just um, project, uh, sorry, uh, classes that we search here as well. We also search the editor itself. So if you can't remember how to do something, if you can't remember the keyboard shortcut for refactoring, for renaming, for any of those kinds of things, hit search everywhere and start typing. And we'll search for actions and also preferences as well for you. So really a great way to try and find things in your code. The second keyboard shortcut 
is Alt-Enter. This is our do everything kind of thing. This is wherever you are in the code, you can hit Alt-Enter and you'll be able to do something from there. It gives you context actions, it gives you quick fixes for inspections, it gives you a whole bunch of things you can do. So you can see in the, um, in the screenshot here, if we've got a warning, we can put a, a squiggly, a little inspection underneath a, underneath a code element. And that means that there's something there that can be fixed up. The, the, perhaps it's not meeting naming standards. Perhaps there's going to be a uh, possible null reference there. Um, we can fix those up very easily uh, using the Alt-Enter keyboard shortcut. It gives you a, a list of items which you can do to change things, uh, and it'll fix that particular issue. But you can also use it where there isn't an inspection, and that'll do like a context action that's there. So I could do it here to convert a public interface into an internal interface just very quickly. Alt-Enter, bang, it's, it's fixed. Uh, and the other thing to uh, note, two, two more things to note on here. At the very bottom of the menu, there's uh, three or four items which are mostly static. Navigate to, refactor this, inspect, and generate code. Those are the entry points into pretty much all the functionality that you've got left to do. So if you want to refactor something, it's got its own uh, menu, but if you can't remember the menu keyboard shortcut, hit Alt-Enter, it's right there. Same with inspection, same with um, uh, generating code. And finally, like with Search Everywhere, if you do Alt-Enter and start typing, it'll search for actions. So again, if you can't remember the keyboard shortcut for rename, do Alt-Enter, type rename, and it'll be there for you. So these are great sort of survival tips just to get started before you have to learn all those keyboard shortcuts. As for getting started, you know, if you've got a brand new um, ID that you want to use and try out, how do you get started? The simplest way is to just open an existing solution. If you've got uh, an existing solution already there, just open it all up and everything will be fine. What Rider will do is the very first time it opens a solution is it will put a plugin into your project. And so we drop this DLL into the plugins folder there. Don't check this into source control. Um, it's a binary file, there's no need. We'll keep it up to date. We'll keep it um, uh, up to date with a particular version of Rider that you're using. So just e exclude that from source control. And once it's been put there, switch back to Unity. Unity will load it, and the first thing the plugin does is configure Unity for you. So it sets it up as the external default external script editor. Uh, and you're good to go then. See, very important, switch back to Unity. If you don't have an existing solution file, um, there's uh, ways of working with that. Newer versions of Unity in the external script editor drop down, already fine Rider, you can just drop down there, select it, select Rider, double click on a file, and everything is good. Otherwise, you can go to browse, you can go and find your install of, uh, of Rider, and again, that will generate a solution file it will load um, the solution up, Rider will install the plugin, and it'll generate, uh, it'll configure everything all up for you. Once installed as well, we have a preference pane there which allows you to do a few other things, it allows you to select which particular version of Rider you're using. If you've gotten uh, a couple of versions installed, you can make sure it's the default editor, and you can work with a few options that are going on there. Okay, that's enough of the pictures. Let's have a look at the actual thing. This is Rider. This is um, the ID itself, and it looks as you'd expect there, sort of uh, nice sort of user interface. Project model on the left-hand side there, we can view it as a traditional sort of C-sharp style project with solutions and projects, or we can have a look at it in a slightly more uh, Unity-friendly way, in a way which is very familiar to the, the Project Explorer in, um, in Unity itself. And we get to view all the files that are in there, uh, and we also, in the assets folder, sorry, uh, and we will also show you all your packages as well. So for more recent versions of Unity, we'll list all the packages. We'll list the source package that you've got uh, locally installed in your packages folder. Uh, and we'll also list the packages then that you've got uh, referenced then in your manifest JSON. And if you kind of hover over the uh, item there, it'll give you a little bit of information about that particular package. We'll also try and sort of call information out for you in the uh, assets folder here. So here you can see we've got gizmos highlighted. So any of the special folders that Unity uses, they're kind of highlighted there to show you that there's uh, important stuff going on here. Uh, for example, we've got editor highlighted uh, on the side there. That means that there's some code in there which belongs to an editor um, assembly. And so we're trying to call that out for you. And again, with the post-processing one, we've got in brackets the name of the assembly that's being referenced there. So post-processing project is um, going to include, sorry, the post-processing folder belongs to the post-processing project. And you can see there we've got an assembly definition file in there, and in fact, we've got some uh, automatic work there with, um, with, with assembly definition files as well, so you can edit those and get code completion and so on there. 
And of course, if you, uh, once you've got everything set up there, you can also just double click on a, a file there and it'll open up in, in uh, Rider as you'd expect. And here now we get to see the, uh, the code itself. And it's a nice editor experience there showing you the, the code that you've got. And here we can see now some of the um, inspections at work here. For example, we've got a, uh, an inspection here telling me that I've spelt targetable wrong, which is a nice one. But let's go somewhere else. Let's go and have a look. So I can do the shift, shift, and navigate somewhere else. And I can navigate to, say, um, my tower defense input string, uh, scheme switcher. And I've got an inspection here, which is uh, it's, it's a C-sharp sort of generic inspection here, but it's a good one. It's, it's useful uh, information there. It's telling us that this class has got virtual members, but nobody's inheriting from it. So we can get rid of those virtual members because it's just going to uh, cause uh, an overhead when we actually call the uh, methods in the first place. So I can use my Alt-Enter keyboard shortcut uh, and see what I've got here that I can do. So uh, the first thing I can do is uh, an action which will fix up that particular thing and it'll make the class sealed for me, and it'll uh, edit the code and fix things up. And if I want to see what's changed, I can go down to um, my source control uh, and bring up a diff and see what the difference is there, and I can see that it's added the sealed keyword. It's changed my protected virtual methods into private, uh, and it's edited a few things there. And I can make changes here as well. So I can see that I've got another inspection here telling me that I've got a public uh, field which I can turn it into, sorry, public property which I can turn into a private one, and I can edit that sort of directly in the diff view here. Oh, excuse me. OK, so we've got more inspections as well, useful ones here. So uh, useful one here, which is going to be like uh, telling us that we've got a C-sharp, uh, well, it, we can use a new C-sharp feature. So this is useful if you're migrating from C-sharp 4, for example, up to C-sharp 6. We can help you now learn some of those different uh, language constructs and how to use them. And we can just now very quickly rewrite that into uh, an expression body property uh, in new C Sharp 6 syntax. And from there, we can start to learn how to use those new features and help you migrate as well into uh, a more terse way of working with your code. And we can see here as well in this particular pane, um, this editor, that we have uh, some knowledge of uh, Unity's API here. We, we are discovering really that this class actually belongs to Unity and is used by Unity. And we've got a little icon in the corner here, which is telling us now that we've got a uh, scripting component. Uh, we've, we've, we're highlighting here that this class belongs to, um, to Unity, is implicitly used by Unity. And we also have uh, uh, methods as well highlighted to show us uh, when Unity's event functions are being called there. And if we hover over those, we get some uh, little documentation there, little text summary to show us what's going on. And if we just start typing as well, we then get a list of all the items that are available to us, and we can auto-complete and create some of those uh, methods there. So it's very easy then to sort of create new methods and, uh, and bring those into our class. Again, we can use the alt enter keyboard shortcut here to get into one of the main bits of functionality, which is our generating code. And here gives us a list of things which are perhaps a bit C-sharp specific. So we can generate uh, dispose methods or constructors or properties or the dispose pattern. But we've also got at the bottom there Unity items. So I can select that. And we get a list now of all the uh, particular event functions which I can use in this class. It gives us me a whole list of items and uh, a little bit of a description as to what that class uh, method does. And I can select a few of them at once and apply them and quickly generate code. Hopefully, you'll be a bit more, uh, you pay a bit more attention to which ones you create when you create them. But we can very quickly uh, create those items. And again, if we sort of hover our uh, mouse over the name of those, we'll get a bit of uh, description of what's going on there. And we can bring up the, the, the uh, tooltip item, click on the link here, and we will then load the documentation for it as well. So we can very quickly get you to the, uh, the area you wanted to get to. Sorry, so um, I was just asked then how I was doing that. Uh, I used a keyboard shortcut. So to invoke that, we can do um, a keyboard shortcut. And again, if we don't know what the keyboard shortcut is, we can do Alt-Enter. We can just start typing. We can do quick documentation. We can use the F1 keyboard shortcut in this key map. Uh, and that will then bring us up a tooltip, which has decided to sit down there. And then we've got an ex a link to external documentation at the bottom here. And so what will happen there is if we click on that, that will take us to our locally installed documentation. If we don't have any documentation locally installed, we'll go to the website, 
uh, and we'll bring up the appropriate documentation of the appropriate version. So we also know about um, serialized fields as well, and we'll, we'll highlight a serialized field. So if I just create a new one, uh, let's just create a string of, I don't know, agents. There, we're now highlighting that one on the left there. So you've got a little icon there to say that this is a serialized field. We know that this field is being initialized by Unity. It's being used externally uh, by Unity. In fact, we've got an inspection there straight away. Uh, and we're saying that this name doesn't match the, uh, the, the naming rule we've got for serialized fields. We want to have it begin with a lowercase. So I can, again, quickly Alt-Enter and rename that and uh, give it the appropriate name. And one thing that's really nice here is that, again, we know what a serialized field is. And we know that we've actually just uh, rename something. By renaming a field like that, we might actually break existing serialized data. Uh, and so we'll automatically put in the formally serialized as attribute there as well. So we know what the, uh, so, so Unity can um, fall back and load up data that already exists. And once we've got our serialized field here as well, we've got some context actions we can do with this. So if we say, well, actually, I don't want to make it a serialized field, I can disable it. I can say it's non-serialized. My attribute here is now redundant, so I can quickly remove that. And again, I can make it serialized again if I want to, or I can put hide and inspect. And I can very quickly work around with those and uh, very quickly manipulate how my, uh, my classes work and the fields that are used in there as well. Some more sort of things with code completion as well. If you just start typing, we'll start to complete it for you as well. So it, it's smart there. We've got things in brackets where it says uh, in core.health. Uh, that means that we're pulling in a type which isn't specified in the current set of usings, but we can still do it. And if I uh, select that, we'll see that using core.health has been added to the top there. So the idea is to be very, very quick about importing things that you need, working with the code that you need, and getting you to where you want to be. OK, so let's go and have a look at some inspections. We've seen some uh, C-sharp specific inspections. Let's go and have a look at some uh, Unity specific ones. Let me just roll this back a sec. Version control is great. So um, we, we have a number of different uh, Unity specific uh, inspections here, and this is where things really start to get interesting, where things are really useful for you. We'll start to call out uh, common mistakes, common uh, patterns which are against best practices, and try and help you uh, work towards um, better practices, really. So for example, a, a thing like this, a nice simple one, you've got an empty event function. This is still going to get called by Unity, um, but it's not doing anything. So you've got an overhead of Unity calling uh, a method, but it's not actually doing anything. We'll call that out, and we'll give you a very quick alt interaction to remove that. We have um, similar sort of things here, which will call out uh, some inefficiencies here, some performance-related items here. If I'm comparing a tag against a string literal, for example, this is going to allocate uh, for me. And I can do better than that. I can use the compare tag um, API there. And so we're going to warn you, we're going to tell you that, and we're going to very quickly be able to rewrite that uh, and call you uh, uh, and correct it for you. What's useful here as well? is that if we, go, if we do alt enter and we go down to the Inspections menu, we get a couple of items here where we can do things like disabling it. We can change the severity of the warning. If you don't care, just stop nagging me. It's fine. But one of the nice things we've got here as well is why is Rider suggesting this? And if you select that one, we open up a, a new web page which has got an explanation of what's going on here. So it's not just blindly giving you, uh, well, shouting at you and nagging you to change something. We're trying to give you proper qualified advice and help you then to give you the reasons behind this inspection and the reasons behind uh, what's going on there. So we'll do also link off to the documentation here. We'll link off to the Unity documentation. We'll link off to, to Unity's blog posts and provide you with proper information for working with it. And we have a, a whole load of other interesting inspections here as well. So we've got uh, things like uh, you using get component uh, with a, a string literal here. We're saying you know, that's an overhead there because it has to convert the string literal and look that up and find the actual type there. It's going to be much easier to use the generic item. So again, a quick alt enter can rewrite that for you, use the generic item. Uh, we've got warnings here to say you're using uh, a version of Raycast all which is going to allocate. And we can actually help you there and say you want to use a non-allocating version of that. And so we can do alt enter, convert it to the uh, Raycast non-alloc and rewrite that for you and leave you in a position now to uh, pass in an array so that you don't have to allocate your, your data. 
Similar thing then with something like Overlap Box and with other items there in the physics uh, namespace which have got um, uh, non-allocating versions of them. We'll also give you warnings as well when you're doing things like camera.main uh, being used inefficiently inside an update method there. So update is being called frequently there. You don't want to be using camera.main because that's going to call uh, get component, and, and it's an expensive call. And in fact, we're taking this further in the next version that we're working on at the moment, uh, which we are trying to add in some new performance um, inspections there, specifically for when you're in a performance-sensitive context. So when you're in an update method or a late update, fixed update method, so on, we know when there are uh, some expensive methods being called, and we're going to highlight those for you. So for example, here we've got an update method, which is calling get components. And we know the get component here is expensive, and so we're going to highlight that for you. We know that doing a comparison against null is expensive. It's going to do a native call, and so we're going to highlight that for you. But the difference here is that this isn't a, a squiggly kind of warning, nagging kind of thing, because you might actually want to be doing this. There might be a legitimate reason for you to check against null. But we want to inform you now that there's a cost to this, so you don't just uh, go in and do it. And we can do this with, uh, with coroutines as well. So we can recognize now when a coroutine is being used, uh, sorry, when a method is being used as a coroutine, and when you're using then an expensive method in that particular instance. And one thing we can do nicely with coroutines as well is that we can navigate between them. So I can do find usages on my, uh, my coroutine method here, and it'll take me back to the string literal. OK. And so we have uh, lots more sort of other Unity-specific inspections which are going to help you out here as well. So things like when you are using uh, attributes on a particular method there, th things can compile fine and everything, but there's no way of knowing that you've actually got the right um, method signature. So we'll help you here and we'll warn you. So for example, if you've got runtime initialize load on, on load method, it needs to be a static method. We'll call that out for you and help you write that. So again, it's trying to find things that happen at, um, while you're editing um, before you actually encounter them at runtime. A similar sort of thing here on post process uh, scene where we've got the wrong parameters being passed in. We know what parameters it should be, and so we can help you fix those up and help you get those correct. Same with a do draw gizmo there. We can do similar things with some of the magic string methods there, like with, with start coroutine, with invoke and invoke repeating. I can uh, navigate now between my um, my, my method and the actual string literals that are there. So it's so trying to add a little bit of type safety into something which isn't type safe. And so I can do find usages on these as well. And I can then very quickly see where this method is being used. And I can see it's actually being used in the string literal version of an invoke, invoke method. And that works for uh, start coroutine, stop coroutine, uh, invoke, invoke repeating, and so on. Uh, and other things that we want to try and do to try and prevent issues before you hit them at runtime, uh, uh, and to present the number of times you have to swap back and forwards between the editor and, uh, uh, and Unity itself, um, are things like, um, like creating a new instance of a mono behavior. So this is, this is fine. This will compile. This will get through uh, Unity. But then you'll start playing. Uh, and then Unity will finally complain and say, you can't do this. Because if you try and create a mono behavior with new, it doesn't get a chance to wire up all of the event functions. And so we can call it out right here, right now, and help you rewrite that into, um, into uh, an add component call on a game object. And we'll try and find then the game objects that you wanted to, to actually add it to as well. Look at the parameters, look at the fields that are available to us. And a similar thing with scriptable instance, uh, scriptable object, sorry. We'll call create instance on that. So we have a, a number of uh, interesting inspections that we can uh, help here, and we can, we can fix things up for you, uh, and, and which will there to help and to try and uh, make with best practices. And then we have other things which are just a little bit cool. So we have here, we highlight in colors there. So we have uh, Unity colors, red, green, and blue. We highlight those in the editor. And what I can do here is I can also hit Alt-Enter, and I'll get the chance to pick it from a palette and save it. And it will then uh, show it in the editor and highlight it nice and dark. Let's pick a different color. Let's go with blue. And what's more is if I've got my game available to me there, I can use the uh, color picker and go over to my game and select the value then straight from the game there and use it directly in the editor. Uh, this also works um, in uh, shaders as well. So for example, here we've got a, a color. We can do the same sort of thing here, pick it from the palette, uh, or again, use the color picker then to actually go off to, to where the color is being used and pick that up and use it. 
Um, more support for stuff in shaders. You know, we've got to have some uh, syntax highlighting, uh, syntax error highlighting, um, also some things like uh, where values are being used and some code completion. Uh, more work in there as well. And um, yeah, so it, it's cool, that shaders. Um, what should we look at next? Yeah, so, so that's good. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing that the, um, the plugin that we do, we drop in the plugin. Let me just show you where that is again. So we have the, the plugins folder here. We put a plugin into your project. You don't check this one into source control. That gives us a, a number of things we can do, uh, which is uh, very useful and very cool. First thing we can do, for example, is we have a play button on the toolbar there so we can actually switch your code into play mode. And let's see if that's going to work or if I have compile errors. Yep, so there we go. It's just compiling the scripts. Switches into play mode, uh, and we're good to go. And here I can control that, and I can put it into pause mode, or I can flick it back into uh, play mode uh, straight from the, the, uh, the editor we've got there. And of course, we set up the debugger as well. So when we recognize that you're opening a Unity project, uh, we'll configure the debugger automatically. So it'll automatically connect to the, uh, to the Unity editor, uh, and it'll also uh, add another configuration where we can attach to the editor and play. We just need to hit the debug button then, and we lose Unity. <laughs> it's great. All right, so while that's reloading, I'll show you the other thing to do with uh, Unity is under this uh, Unity icon we've got going on over here, we've got uh, an attached to Unity process um, item which will go off and it'll look on the network to see if you have any players that are available there and it'll list the players such as your iPhone, your, your Android devices and so on. Uh, and it'll list those there and we can click those and attach the debugger to those as well. So we can debug uh, your players. It'll work with the IL to CPP backend as well, which is uh, very useful for working with things. And let's see, where are my scenes? Hello? There it is. Let's just run that. All right, we'll attach the debugger, and hopefully this will work better this time around. That's better. So yeah, so the debugger's automatically configured, and it's connected, and once we uh, start something, if we hit, say, a, uh, a particular breakpoint there, obviously we'll load the breakpoint, and we get to see uh, the, the debug data, as you'd expect. We've got the same sort of traditional view of a debugger there. We've got a call stack. We've got the variables and the properties on the, the right-hand side there. Uh, we can extend these out. We can set these values. Uh, what, what should we set something to? Use GUI layout. We can set that value to be true. And it's, it's all set, and it's all good. And we can then uh, step over code, step into code, uh, and then, of course, if we want to go back a bit as well, we can just grab the instruction pointer and move us back to where we are. So this won't rewind where we are and everything, but it'll just change the, uh, the, the current position of where the instruction pointer is. So we get to, to try something again. We might have changed state already, but it's still a, a great tool for sort of doing debugging and doing useful things. Now, um, I'm going to just show you something else, which is really nice, too. Um, we have a decompiler, so that we get code uh, automatically decompiled items, so we can then go and have a look at something which is in Unity Engine, for example, and we can see the standalone input module, and we can have a look at the code that's available in there. Uh, and if we go to uh, process mouse events, we can put a breakpoint in here, and we can just carry on running, let's let that run. And if we click the button again there, we're now actually debugging some decompiled code. So if you have a piece of code which you don't understand, you know, you're trying to interact with, uh, with, with Unity or another third-party assembly, DLL, uh, and you don't know what's going on, you can just step into it. You can uh, decompile it, you can put a breakpoint in, uh, and you can see what's going on there. You can uh, look at all the, uh, the data that's available to you there. You can set values, you can, do, uh, you can step over items, and you can carry on running, and all is good. And I just want to show you something else. Let's uh, click that again. Uh, something else which we're working on for the next version, which is uh, really rather nice, is that we are extending the data that's being shown in the debugger. So if I've got the, uh, the currently active scene, for example, right down the bottom now we've got the list of, we've added a new item here, a new folder, which is going to be the list of game objects. So this gives you all the root game objects. 
So right from your scene, you can see now what, uh, what game objects are attached to it. And you can step into those game objects and look at the children. And you can sort of step down. You get your hierarchy view in the debugger. And for each game object as well, we get to list all the components that are there. So you can now examine the, the component data that's attached to your game objects uh, right in the debugger. OK, so uh, where are we here? Right, so one thing which is nice here as well is if we uh, start off a, 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 a wave of the game here, we get to see now that we've got some items coming into the console. So we're logging every time an enemy is being spawned here. And we get a, a log event happening, and we get a block of code, a block of text here, which we can't do anything with. It's uh, useful information. It's clearly a stack trace. It's clearly something uh, useful and code related, but it's not where our code is. So thanks to our plugin, we've actually bring that into, uh, into Rider itself as a, uh, as a tool window. And we get to click on those items there. And where we had a block of text now, we've got a parsed stack trace. So you can actually now sort of navigate around. And you can click on these links here to take you to wherever you want to go. Uh, and also to click on the, uh, the method names and navigate uh, around the methods and also the classes themselves as well. So it gets you to uh, use that console information where you need it, which is inside the editor itself. OK, I'm going to switch projects now. And uh, let's have a look at that one. And we're going to talk about uh, unit testing. So we'll do unit testing. Thought so. Yep. Um, right, well, we want to help you do unit testing as well. And uh, if, you've, if you've tried it with any units in, uh, in Unity, you know that if you're trying to use any of the Unity APIs, you have to be running in the Unity instance. So uh, a very simple sample project here. If I try and run those, uh, they have to run in the Unity instant editor instance. Uh, and I've got this uh, editor uh, window which I can use to do things. And if I've got an error going on here, again, it's a block of text which I can't really do anything with, but I need to go over back to my editor to work with. Um, well, Rider will actually be able to help you with that as well. So we'll discover tests in the editor itself. We've got a little icon here, and we've got a, a little icon uh, next to each particular test itself. And we can run all of the tests, again, just with Alt Enter and run all. Uh, or we can run one test in particular. That will tell uh, Unity itself to run the tests, and we'll display the results here for you. And again, we've got something here. If there's a, an error, we've got a stack trace, which we can click on, which we can navigate to, get you to where the error is. We see what the message is. We can fix up the issue. Uh, if I save that, and then if I just run the test again, hopefully, once it's refreshed, yeah, we're back to green, and, uh, and we're all good. And so we're going to want to try and help you write unit tests as well and work with that. Currently, we only work with um, edit mode tests, uh, but we're working on adding play mode tests in there as well. OK, so I think that brings me to the end of what I want to show you. So um, these are some of the things that I've shown you then, really, uh, which, we've got, which are Unity-specific features. There's a, a whole load of things there. Um, sort of, you know, the debugger's automatically configured. This is really useful. Being able to debug players is also, also very helpful. Calling out the, uh, the Unity, the, the, the methods and the fields and the classes that are being used by Unity is right there on the editor, instant, on the editor surface for you. Uh, lots of inspections. And the key thing I want to show you with that one is the why is Rider suggesting this. There's a lot of information behind some of those suggestions, not just the Unity ones, but the uh, more C-sharp generic ones as well. There's lots of information there as to why those are being uh, um, worked with as well. We've got uh, support for file templates as well, so you can create new files. Uh, and you can define your own file templates and, and add those in so you can have things how you want them to do. Uh, and we do silent project reload as well. So if you add a new file, Rider will just load it. It's fine. We won't bother you asking you. It'll just get added in, and it's good. Because we're built on top of ReSharper, which has been around for a good while now, we get well over 2,000 inspections. Um, well over 400 context actions, uh, and well over 50 uh, refactoring. So there's a, a depth to uh, the, the, the functionality here that you can use. And you know, this is a very quick list of things which are just standard rider features which are not uh, Unity specific. There's a whole bunch of really cool things in here. Uh, code formatting, um, very configurable code style layouts, things like uh, highlighting regular expressions. The decompiler I've shown you there, the uh, version control system, the diff view. Uh, version control, we've got a really cool tool in there, which is uh, local history, which is kind of for when 
you change things in between check-ins. So there's that whole thing of it was working 10 minutes ago. I wish I could just roll back 10 minutes. That's exactly what local history does. It takes snapshot of your, snapshots of your code as you're working and allows you to very quickly roll back to something. Uh, and of course, then the, because we're based on uh, IntelliJ, we get a, well over about 1,000 plugins which are available for Rider at the moment as well. And very, very, very importantly as well, there's a dark theme. So uh, we got you covered there. Uh, and if you want to get a hold of it, uh, you can download a 30-day trial version, um, jetbrains.com slash unity. If you're a student, you get it for free. Go to, to uh, jetbrains.com slash students. Uh, and we also do a 50% discount for startups as well. So uh, I'm just going to finish off now. I'm just going to say thank you. Those are the links there if you want to get it. The uh, Unity-specific part of Rider is actually an open source project. If you want to raise issues, you can do so against that, the, that on, uh, on GitHub. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ping me on uh, Citizen Matt on Twitter there. Uh, and other than that, I'm just going to say thank you. And I think we have time for questions. And if anyone has a question, there's microphones at the back there. Um, so thank you. Hi. Hello. Any plans to add continuous testing to the test runner? Uh, continuous testing, uh, there are no plans at the moment. Uh, we're concentrating right now on adding support for play mode tests. Okay. We very much want to have play mode tests in there. Uh, and then looking forward, things like uh, code coverage would be great as well. But continuous testing is less of a, uh, it's lower down the list, but it's a good one. Thank you. Uh, uh, great tool. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so is the why is Rider suggesting this stuff keyed to the particular version of Unity that you're using? Do you plan, have plans to sort of update it and keep it in sync? Or? The idea is to keep it in sync, um, and it'll, it's not particularly keyed to a particular version. So the, the inspections should hopefully be version specific. We don't have anything at the moment which I think is uh, particularly for a, ver for a particular version. Um, but when we will, we'll, we'll call it out in that documentation. Yeah, and we'll keep that documentation up to date. And, uh, and add that. We've added some new inspections for the new release. We haven't yet added those into the, the documentation there, but they will be there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, cool. Hello. I, I don't frequently work in uh, shader programming, but yes. when I do, I'd love to have my hand held in the way that you guys are holding our hands when we were working in C Sharp. Yep. And I, was, I saw you had some minor hand holding and then suggestions going on in shaders, and I was yes. wondering, is, does it go into as in depth as the C Sharp right now? Uh, uh, right now suggestions it, and best practices and right now it doesn't. The, the right now uh, we really want to improve the, uh, the the level of support we've got for shaders right now. Right now it's basically simple completion. Uh, we've we've got so support for some syntax highlighting, some syntax error highlighting, uh, but basically it's uh, it's simple completion in there at the moment. Uh, we are looking at improving this for future versions. It's it's absolutely something we want to do. Okay. And we do want to have inspections and all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. So I noticed at the top of the IDE, you had some context menus for Git. And so if you uh, have some uh, source control integration with Git or TFS or what have you, is that just for scripts? Or if you, in your project, add materials, rename materials, is that all getting handled uh, through these menus in the IDE? Yep, so the source control will cover everything that's in your, uh, in your folder. So here's a probably good example. Yep, so I haven't got a, an ignore in for my, uh, for my plugin uh, at the moment on this one here. And so it wants to add that in there. So it's not going to add. It's, it'll be anything under the project folder. It will, uh, it will list and allow you to add and work with and so on. So uh, yeah, so for example, there we've got an asset which is being used there. Yeah. Um, and it will then uh, list everything that, that is in the, in the project itself rather than um, anything that is in the sort of C-sharp scripting side of things. So okay. it's folder-based, basically. Great. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first off, thanks for making this. I'm, I personally use Writer. I love it a lot. Awesome. Thank uh, you. Hopefully, this isn't too big of a question, but what would you say the advantages are of using Writer over somebody who prefers to use Visual Studio with the ReSharper plugin? What does Writer give you that's, say, better than using that old style? Yeah, this is a great question because Writer is based on top of ReSharper. So the, the C Sharp analysis engine we're using for Writer, which provides all the navigation and the inspections and everything, is ReSharper. We're running it. Uh, out of process as a 64-bit process, uh, and it is doing pretty much the same job. And so if you have Visual Studio and ReSharper, then you're getting a lot of the same functionality. In fact, the, the Unity support we've got here, the inspections at least are available as a plugin to ReSharper uh, for Visual Studio. 
And if that's working out for you, that's absolutely fine. You know, that, that's great. We'll support you for that. And what Rider can offer on top of that are things like cross-platform support. So we can use it on your Mac, Windows, Linux. Um, we can then have uh, a few more other things. So the ability to control the, uh, the editor from within Rider. So hit the play button and have that uh, turn your project into play mode. That's only going to be in Rider. Same with the, the unit testing at the moment. We don't have any support for that in ReSharper. Uh, and also the, the Unity, the log viewer, for example, that's not going to be in ReSharper either. So um, Rider has more features than, um, than, than ReSharper with the ReSharper plugin. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so those, those, those are kind of the main differences. The other things then are the differences between sort of Visual Studio and ReSharper and Rider itself. And with that, it's the cross-platform. It's the having things in separate processes, having access to a 64-bit process, so better use of memory and better use of garbage collection, uh, and so on. And uh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. OK, cool. Thank you. Hi. So we make iOS and Android games. Yes. Will Rider understand, say, um, Objective-C code in a stickers extension for iOS or Java code in a third-party SDK that we have to bring into our game for Android? It doesn't, no. So Rider is all about, uh, about C-sharp. Um, it also has support for, for web tooling. So it, Rider itself is a general purpose .NET IDE. We've got specific Unity support in there. Um, but it is a uh, general purpose .NET IDE, which means that it has support for C-sharp. It's also got VB and F-sharp. Um, and it's got support for web tooling. Uh, but it doesn't have any support for, uh, for, for, for those languages there, Java or, or, or um, Objective-C. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so if you're doing work in a solution outside of the Unity project, and you build and copy the DLLs into a Unity project, will you still be able to use the uh, Unity attached to process log output, for example? Um, yes. So we have added support. So we will recognize if you are a, um, building a project which is not a Unity um, assets-based project. You know, so a Unity project, this is going to be too many uses of the word project here. Uh, so if you have uh, a Unity project, a folder which has got assets and everything in it, and um, you're trying to build a class library, and the class library solution lives in that folder structure, then we'll recognize that and we'll automatically set everything up to be a Unity Unity-based rider project. Um, everything's project-based. And we will then give you all of the Unity features that I've just shown you. Uh, we will also uh, recognize when you, you have a Unity engine DLL reference in there and uh, set things up that are there appropriately. If things are not available, you can just do edit configurations, and you can add. And we've got the attached to Unity editor here as well. So you can manually configure some of these things and manually add them in if they're not automatically there. This sort of drop down here probably won't be visible in that particular case. So our attached to Unity process for attaching to players won't be visible there. However, it's also in the run men menu here. So you can attach the Unity process. So you should be able to do everything manually um, if we haven't automatically detected that this is a uh, Unity project. Okay. One, of the, one of the key things is knowing um, which Unity editor instance you're talking to. And that's best known by being actually in the Unity assets folder structure. Thank you. OK, thank you. Hi, um, I was curious, uh, will Writer be able to create managed libraries? Can you create managed libraries? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So um, you can use it to create a standalone uh, project. So we can just go to File, New. And we've got a whole bunch of templates here. As I say, it's a general purpose .NET. ID there. We've actually got a template here, which is a Unity class library template, which will uh, include a, uh, a path to Unity Engine DLL there. You can specify your own path. We find it by default and, uh, and populate that. But you can specify your own and do that and, and just set up a, a class library, which you can then drop into your um, Unity project as a, as a DLL asset. Perfect. Thank you. OK, cool. Thank you. One uh, last question, I think. Another um, version control question. Yes. Um, are you guys going to be compatible with Unity's Collaborate at all? No, we're not. There is no API to Collaborate, okay. so uh, we, we, can't, we can't work with it. Gotcha. So no, we, we, we work with, um, with Git, Subversion, Mercurial, um, TFS, Perforce, uh, and I think there are a couple of uh, plugins for things. I think Plastic have a plugin for it, uh, which you have to download from their website, uh, but that's about it, I think. And I think that leaves us out of time, so uh, I just want to say thank you for coming. And um, please download it and give it a go. Give the trial version a go.